Before we start today, this video is sponsored by Manscaped. I got a lot of questions about why I look like this, and while actually this isn't my real face, here's what I truly look like. Magnificent, right? I'm able to maintain this form thanks to the Performance Package 4.0 from Manscaped, which I legitimately actually use regularly, more specifically the Lawnmower 4.0, which is the best electrical trimmer I've ever used. I'm one of those people that spends an hour in the shower, so the fact that this thing is completely waterproof is super helpful. And even though I don't have a nose, the Weed Whacker 2.0 gets rid of my nose hairs effortlessly and painlessly. Just don't ask how. Take my word for it, it's nice. In this package you also get these two crop preservers for your nuts, and two free gifts being a very nice travel bag and a pair of boxers. And if you use code PJIGGLES at checkout with the link in my description, you get 20% off and free shipping. It's a great deal all around, so be sure to check it out, I can vouch for it. Thanks again to Manscaped for supporting the channel today, and now let's get on with the video. The question of what is the biggest video game franchise of all time is a tricky one. You could say it's Super Mario because, well, it's Mario, everyone knows about him. But you could also say it's Pokemon. It's the most profitable franchise ever, so that could count, but there aren't really a lot of Pokemon-inspired games out there. Grand Theft Auto is certainly up there as well. GTA V was a cultural phenomenon when it released 10 years ago. Currently, it's even the second best-selling game in the world after Minecraft, which itself is certainly also up for debate. But Minecraft is really just big because of one game. There are other games in the series, but they are nowhere near as well-known or big as the original. Point is, it's a messy question. It all depends on your definition of what biggest franchise really means. But you know how we could make it a question that a lot more people will agree on, probably? if we change it to what's the most influential video game franchise ever, because now there's really only one correct answer, and that would be The Legend of Zelda. There aren't many games you could say change the world of gaming forever, but The Legend of Zelda has three of those under its belt, A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, and Breath of the Wild. A Link to the Past was not only an incredible game, but it pretty much perfected the adventure game style of gameplay and exploration that the first Zelda game laid the groundwork for. The creators of Grand Theft Auto and Dark Souls, two of the biggest names in gaming, have both cited A Link to the Past as a main source of inspiration for those series. Ocarina of Time not only set the groundwork for all 3D Zelda games to follow, but almost all 3D games in general, and it's been the single highest rated game ever released for a very long time now. And many years later, Breath of the Wild, currently the most sold Zelda game of all time, changed open world gaming forever, which has debatedly been the biggest genre in gaming since its release in 2017. Even within Nintendo themselves has Breath of the Wild inspired other games, it's often called the most important game of the 2010s for a good reason. All this is to say, The Legend of Zelda is an incredibly important franchise, and if you ask me, the single most influential video game franchise of all time. So then why does its representation in Smash Brothers suck so much? Smash Brothers features a lot of franchises, no duh, and chief among them is The Legend of Zelda. It was one of the 10 franchises in the first Smash game's playable roster after all. Nowadays there are 6 Zelda characters in Smash, or should I say 3, Link, Zelda, and Sheik. Those are the 3 Zelda characters. Yun Link and Toon Link are just faster versions of Link, and Ganondorf is just a slower version of Captain Falcon for some reason. There's a lot more to it than that, but personally I don't think The Legend of Zelda's representation in Smash is very well done at all, mostly via the character's movesets. I don't talk about it much since I have a Smash Brothers channel, but The Legend of Zelda is my all-time favorite feeding game franchise. I grew up with games like Ocarina of Time, Twilight Princess, and especially Wind Waker. And nowadays if I were to give you a list of my favorite games ever, you'd get an eyeful of Zelda games. I even have a 10-year-old cat in real life named Zelda. Guess where that name comes from. Anyways, back to Smash Brothers. There's a big difference between having a lot of representation and good representation. For example, Persona only has one character, but it's represented amazingly. Joker's moveset is a good example of what a Persona user can do in the series. Its one stage has entirely different designs based on other Persona games, Joker's alts also reference other Persona games, and he even has a costume with an alt inspired by an important character in his game story, he has some extremely unique qualities to his victory screens that references his home games, etc, etc, etc. I could literally keep going for hours about how well Persona is represented in Smash. On the contrary, Pokemon has a lot of characters and stages, but I think its representation is lacking as well. Besides Red and Leaf, who aren't even called that in Smash, there are absolutely zero beloved human characters in the game, not even as a spirit. 
The stages really don't show off the world of Pokemon and are more focused on flaunting different Pokemon species, there are a ton of alts that don't reference anything, let alone many shiny alts, and as with the franchise itself, there is a huge Gen 1 bias. More than half the playable characters are from Kanto, and the region has the most amount of Pokemon summonable with the Pokeball item. It also only has one Mii costume which wasn't even in the game at launch and was added via DLC you had to buy. So that's the difference between good and bad representation. And if you ask me, The Legend of Zelda falls squarely in the second category, even though Zelda has one of the most amount of characters in the game for one franchise. For starters, let's look at those actual characters. In the first Smash game with only 12 slots, one of them was from The Legend of Zelda, being Link, the series' main character. Makes sense. And then the next Smash game had 14 newcomers, and 4 of them were from The Legend of Zelda. Bringing Zelda herself and Sheik, the first swap character in the series, thus sharing the same character slot, Ganondorf, and Yundling. Meaning that about a fifth of the roster was Zelda characters, it had the same amount of slots as Super Mario. Melee was infamously very rushed, and to pad out the amount of newcomers, a lot of them were clone characters, basically tweaked versions of already existing characters on the roster, as they took up less development time to make. And of those six clones introduced, two of them were from The Legend of Zelda. Young Link being a clone of Link, obviously, and Ganondorf being a clone of Captain Falcon. And to this day, this is my least favorite decision ever made in the Smash series, as even though we're over 20 years later now, Ganondorf is still very similar to Falcon. The only reason he was put in the game was because he had a somewhat similar physique to Falcon, and the game needed more clones. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, I'll get back to this. After Melee, we had to wait a long 7 years for the next Smash game, and after all that time when it released, the world was finally blessed with a new Legend of Zelda character. That being... Are you kidding me? Yes, Toon Link joins the roster, being a clone of a character that already had a clone. But don't worry, we removed that old one in this game, so it's completely fine that the Legend of Zelda's playable roster essentially didn't change at all in those 7 years, right? Now to bring a bit of positivity into this video, I actually kinda like the idea behind Toon Link's inclusion. You see, between Melee and Brawl, The Legend of Zelda got 5 new Zelda games with this cartoony art style. The Wind Waker, Four Swords as a side game in a GBA port of A Link to the Past, Four Swords Adventures, The Manish Cap, and Phantom Hourglass. And after Brawl, we got a sixth one, being Spirit Tracks, which was in development at the same time as Brawl. So for a while there, it really seemed like this would be the new art style for the series. But obviously in that time we also got Twilight Princess, being the only Zelda game released between Melee and Brawl to not have this art style, since it got a lot of backlash. Link in Smash was originally based on his appearance in Ocarina of Time, a game in which you have two forms, Young Link and Adult Link. And since in Brawl, his design was changed to be based on Twilight Princess, which doesn't have a younger version of Link, combined with the fact that the series was almost exclusively getting new games with a cartoony art style, it makes complete sense to have the outdated Link clone be replaced with a new one featuring that cartoon style. Toon Link, as they decided to call this version of Link, is based on Wind Waker specifically, which makes sense considering that's the only big boy 3D Zelda game with this art style, and Smash is a game with 3D models. That said, he really is just Young Link again, a smaller, weaker, faster version of Link, that's all he is, which really sucks considering just how much potential there is in Wind Waker for his moveset, but again I'll get to that later. Six more years pass and we get Smash 4, which didn't change the roster of Zelda characters at all from Brawl. The only real changes are that Zelda and Sheik became separate characters, meaning they each get a new down special and Sheik also got a new side special, but Ganondorf and Toon Link weren't changed at all and were still just clone characters. Damn it. Oh, and Link also wasn't changed, but that's okay. And now, four years later in the newest Smash game... Ah, <sighs> yeah, you already know. The only change they made to the Zelda roster was bringing back Young Link, a clone from 17 years ago, meaning Link now has two clones in the same game. Awesome. This is where the crux of this series' crappy representation lies, being their outdated movesets, which I'll go over one by one while giving ideas accompanied with illustrations of how I would change these moves. Starting with Link, of course. And oh my god, I hate what they've done here. Between Smash 4 and Ultimate, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild released, which as I said before, is one of the most important theater games ever released. This game was entirely made to challenge the traditions of all other 3D Zelda games. As you probably know, Breath of the Wild is extremely different from its older brothers. No traditional items, no traditional dungeons, a completely non-linear open world, and no big focus on a huge storyline. 
Link himself even looks completely different than he ever has before, no longer wearing the iconic green tunic and pointy hat, instead sporting no hat and a new blue design. And they decided to change Link's design to this in Ultimate. And do you want to know what this means for his moveset? He now has glowy remote bombs and he's back to having a boring boomerang again. Out of every Zelda game ever, Breath of the Wild easily has the most unique moveset potential. But no, let's just keep him almost the exact same, even though Breath of the Wild was designed to be different. Instead of this made up recovery using the spin attack, why not have him use her volley skill to fly upwards and then glide forwards for a bit with his paraglider, which you do all the time in Breath of the Wild. Why not give him the ability to climb walls, or at least cling to them like some other characters, which you also do all the time in this game? Why not have his shield be the Rook's protection? It literally already is a round bubble shield around him, and it's completely unique to his game. Yoshi has a unique shield in Smash, so why not Link? His side special could be a Sheikah Slate rune ability, like Stasis, something completely unique to Breath of the Wild, instead of just a boomerang, which isn't even a real item in that game, just a one-handed sword you can throw that comes back to you, and also it just breaks like every other weapon in the game, it's not special at all. It sucks even more that he used to have a unique boomerang back in Brawl and Smash 4, where it was the Gale boomerang from Twilight Princess that could pull people in, but no, now he has a boring generic boomerang again, just like his two clones. Yippee. I get not wanting to change the movesets of the original 12 all that much, I really do, but Link has not one, but two clones in Ultimate. The game really wouldn't be missing out much if you gave him a new moveset. Even just his normal non-special moves, Breath of the Wild is the only Zelda game where Link can wield completely different weapons that change his moveset, without transforming. Being the standard one-handed swords, two-handed heavy swords for strong slow attacks, and long spears for weak quick attacks. His smash attacks would be the perfect place for those big heavy weapons to shine, and his aerials could be a cool place to have him use a spear, maybe for quick long reaching pokes kinda like Byleth's forward and back hairs. And I mean he uses different weapons for his moves, so why not Link? You could say Byleth gets DLC privileges of course, but Inkling also uses different weapons and she isn't a DLC character, so that's not a real problem is it? At the very least they did give Link a new fitting final smash in ultimate, so that counts for something I guess. Zelda has never really been a fighter in her home series, she just has magical abilities. So for her smash moveset, they gave her the three magic spells Link can obtain in Ocarina of Time, namely Nehru's Love, Dane's Fire, and Furore's Wind, which I think is really interesting. Her new down special, Phantom Slash, which she got when she was separated from Sheik in Smash 4, is completely made up for Smash, but it references Spirit Tracks, which is really cool considering that's easily the Zelda game where she herself plays the biggest role in both the story and gameplay, and it's still very much a magic attack. Even most of her normals have a magical touch to them. Yeah, moves like forward and backer are just kicks, but they do have that satisfying strong sweet spot mechanic, which also gives it kind of a magical vibe with the sound effect and all. And Sheik... Well, Sheik does almost nothing in the only Zelda game she appears in, so the fact they even made her playable in the first place is interesting. I also really like the fact that in Ultimate, they designed her to be based on the Sheikah stealth outfit from Breath of the Wild, cause why not, it's a cute idea. When they made Zelda a character in Melee, they probably just thought it would be cool to give her the ability to change into a completely different character, since she does so in Ocarina of Time, the game all Zelda characters were based on in Melee. And since she's based on a ninja, they just gave her generic vaguely ninja-like moves, which is fine in my opinion, as there really isn't anything they could base any of her moves on, like, at all. Meaning there's also nothing for me to get mad about. Touché. That said, she does teach Link a bunch of songs on her harp in Ocarina of Time. It could've been cool if she whipped out this harp in a taunt or maybe a victory screen or something, but it's not a big deal, it just could've been neat. Anyways, that just leaves us with these three abominations, Ganondorf, Young Link, and Toon Link. Let's save the worst for last and start with Young Link. And I'm sure you've heard this one before, Young Link should have been more based on Majora's Mask in Ultimate. This might be a hot take amongst my fellow Zelda fans, but for the most part, I actually think Young Link's moveset is fine and should be kept mostly as is, especially considering I said that Link has two clones already and thus he should get a new moveset. Someone needs to keep that old moveset, and with Young Link being a clone of the original Smash Brothers Link, he's the perfect fit. That's not to say I wish it wasn't a little different though. In Majora's Mask, you spend the entire game as Young Link, instead of Ocarina of Time where you only spend maybe 20% of the game as Young Link. So if you ask me, Majora's Mask is Young Link's main game. This game features the unique mechanic of transforming into different beings through masks, namely a forest-based Deku scrub 
a mountain-based Goron, and a water-based Sora. You hear most Zelda fans saying that Yun Link in Smash should have been a swap character where he transforms into these different beings, each with a completely different moveset. And I'm gonna go headfirst in the opposite direction and say no, he shouldn't be like that. When you say this, you're asking the Smash devs to make another Pokemon trainer, arguably the most difficult type of fighting game character to make, considering he's three unique characters in one. And with Yun Link, that would be four characters, or even five if you include Fierce Deity Link. The Smash devs aren't some group of omnipotent gods that can do anything, you know. That said, I think it could work well for his specials, maybe. Just hear me out. In Majora's Mask, Goron Link can use Powder Kegs, which are huge barrels that leave an explosion much stronger than your average bomb. Sora Link has these fins on his arms that he can shoot out as dual boomerangs, which of course also then fly back to you. And Deku Scrub Link can burrow into these flowers, shoot out of it, and then glide in the air for a while using these other flowers. The obvious answer would be to replace his down special bomb with a powder keg, his side special boomerang with the Sora boomerangs, and his up special with this Deku flower burrowing gliding ability. The problem with this is that he'd have to transform for these moves, which isn't realistically possible as quick special attacks in a fighting game you can quickly use back to back. So here's what I propose, and fair warning, it's a little silly, but I think it could work. Instead of completely transforming, he could just do these moves himself in his human form, and then just have the transformation mask on his head as a small visual change to still represent the mask's abilities being used. He could just carry and throw a powder keg himself while wearing the Goron mask, throw those two fin boomerangs just with his hands while wearing the Sora mask, and shoot out of a Deku flower and glide with two other flowers in his hands while wearing the Deku mask. This way his specials still feature a bomb and a boomerang technically, two super classic Zelda items. And his neutral special is fine as is. The bow is a super important item in Majora's Mask specifically, with the elemental arrows being the dungeon items and the key to a lot of puzzles in them, which is a very unique approach for a Zelda game. It's also why I like the fact that he shoots fire arrows in Smash instead of regular ones. And to fix his worst move, Triforce Slash, there's no better choice than having him turn into the Fierce Deity, right? I've already gone on length before about how much I hate Triforce Slash, Young Link and Toon Link's current final smashes, they are completely made up and nothing like this has ever been done in the Zelda series, so it doesn't represent anything either, which is a huge shame since Final Smashes are usually where a character's best representation lies. The almost completion bonus in Majora's Mask is a fourth transformation mask, namely the Fierce Deity, which you get right before the final boss and it allows you to absolutely decimate it as an unstoppable beast of a warrior. Needless to say, it's probably my favorite completion bonus in any game ever, and it's become very iconic in the series. It's an available outfit in Breath of the Wild along with his sword after all. His final smash should just be anything involving this transformation. I honestly don't really care what he does with it as long as it's not try for slash. It could just be a simple cutscene final smash where he just goes ham on you in this form for all I care. It would still be awesome. It's also like the most clear idea for a final smash ever. Seriously, why didn't they do this? All of his normals can stay the same, and just like that, Yun Link's moveset represents Majora's Mask, one of the most beloved Zelda games of all time, really well. And considering Great Bay is basically his stage, which comes from Majora's Mask, it fits perfectly. Now let's move on to a character I actually think has a horribly boring moveset, Toon Link. I already spoke my praise for his inclusion, but man I hate that he's still just a double clone with essentially zero Wind Waker references in his moveset, or any other Toon Zelda game for that matter. Wind Waker has some very unique items. For starters, the Skull Hammer, which is just a big ass hammer, literally already has two uses in the game that could be translated perfectly into smash attacks. The overhead swing could be an easy forward smash, and the roundabout spin is perfect for a down smash that hits on both sides, instead of just being these random sword slashes he has currently. Also, is it just me, or does Toon Link's forward smash look super awkward in Ultimate? I don't know, I never really liked that change from Smash 4. And his up smash can stay the same, I don't really care. Up special is interesting, considering we changed the other Link's up specials, I think Toon Link's can stay the spin attack. Especially considering in Wind Waker, you can learn the iconic Great Hurricane spin, which is basically an insanely long spin attack that you move around with. In an ideal world, they would lengthen the duration of his up special on the ground, and allow you to move around with it if you fully charge it to reference the Great Hurricane spin, which is literally an idea I've proposed in a previous video before. But something I'd like to add on to it is that if you use it in the air as a recovery, the move will play out as normal, but after the last hit, he will whip out his Deku Leaf and glide for a little bit, which is what you could do with the item in Wind Waker. Yes, this does mean we're giving all three links a gliding up special, but yeah, so what? They're still semi-clones, and all three of their games have a gliding mechanic. 
I think it fits for each one of them. As for his other specials, I think side and down are perfect as is, no need to change them, but personally I'd change a neutral special to also be the Deku Leaf, but instead have him use it to shoot out a gust of wind as a slower or charge move so you can't spam it. Obviously this would just push the opponents back, so it could be fun to use as a recovery gimp tool, kinda like Squirtle's neutral special, which also does no damage. And I mean, Toon Link is from the Wind Waker, it's fitting. As for his final smash, I honestly don't know what to change it to considering we already made his up special the Great Hurricane Spin, though maybe it could be a cutscene final smash where he does the iconic finishing blow he performs on Ganondorf at the end of the game. That would be raw as hell. Literally anything other than his current one would be better in my book. Anyways, we're down to the last character, and the one with by far the worst representation in my opinion, Ganondorf. This guy is the main big bad evil dude from the Legend of Zelda series, as you probably already know, and he's actually always the same exact person in every Zelda game he appears in, a little fun fact for you non-Zelda fans out there. He's the only male of the Gerudo tribe we know of in the series. There are supposedly others since one is born every 100 years, but we've only ever seen Ganondorf. He's a powerful magic user, and all his boss fights are super iconic, from the very first one in Ocarina of Time where you play lightning tennis at the top of his castle, to a climactic one-on-one -on -one sword duel at the end of a long boss rush with him in Twilight Princess, to my favorite, his final attempt to kill you in the Wind Waker after he lost everything he worked for as the Great Sea above rains down on you. All his boss fights are awesome and I love them. So yeah, let's not reference any of them in his Smash Brothers moveset. I mean, he has this kick from his Tide Princess moveset, but that's it. Instead, he's just a slower, stronger Captain Falcon. That's how he was created in Melee, and that's how he still is all these years later. We can do a whole lot better. People have been asking for Ganondorf moveset changes for the longest time now. He had a taunt in Brawl in Smash 4 where he pulled out the Sword of the Six Sages he uses in Twilight Princess, so people wanted him to be a sword character, especially considering he also uses swords in The Wind Waker. And then in Ultimate, they finally made him use the sword for his smash attacks only, which is ironic considering they also remodeled him to be based on Ocarina of Time again. But in that game, he never actually used the sword. That sword comes from this Space World 2000 Zelda game teaser. Nice. So you might think I'd say that's bad representation, but honestly, I think it's fine. He's used swords in other games, and this is the only sword we've ever seen this Ganondorf design use, so it's fine in my book, honestly, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense canonically. As for his specials, they all suck. They're all still completely based on Captain Falcon specials, and since his are all based on fire moves, they just base Ganondorf's on vague purple magic stuff. I mean, he's a wizard, right? It makes sense. Falcon Punch? Nah, that's Warlock Punch. Falcon Kick? Nah, that's Wizard Foot. To be fair, some of the moves have gotten a little more Ganondorf-like. For example, Captain Falcon's Raptor Boost has been turned into Flame Choke, which I feel is more fitting for Ganondorf. But still, most of his moves are just vague strongman stuff. Like what the hell is Volcano Kick even supposed to be based on? Instead of Dark Dive, his random up special, why not just make him float? It's the main thing he does in his debut game, Ocarina of Time. The Smash Mod Hue Draw Remix made just that his neutral special, and I think it's perfect. Though if it were to be made an actual recovery move, I think it should go a lot further and also upwards a bit. Kinda like what they gave Dark Samus in this same mod. As for what I would make his neutral special, what else but a lightning orb honestly. It would be funny as hell if you could also play tennis with it, similar to King Dedede's Gordos. It would be especially cool if you could do this during his up special as he floats like in his boss fight. Even just by giving him his float, I think he's become a substantially better representation of Ganondorf from the Legend of Zelda series. As for his other moves, I find it super hard to think of anything else. His awful smash moveset is just so ingrained in my brain that it's hard to imagine it being anything else. Maybe his down special could be some kind of thrust with a sword as a reference to his Twilight Princess fight. And maybe his tilts and jab can be different sword slashes which you can combo into each other, kinda like Meta Knight's forward tilt, as a reference to how he fought in Wind Waker. And his final smash is perfect, it's fine, he just turns into Ganon, it makes complete sense. They could do other smaller stuff to make him more Ganondorf-like also. Huge Raw Remix changes his idol pose to have him cross his arms like he's not taking you seriously, which also feels a lot more fitting for him than whatever the hell this weird pose is. Why the hell does he even do that? Oh right, Captain Falcon does that. Yeah. Like I said, it's hard to think of different Ganondorf stuff with him being as he currently is so stuck in my head, but I'm sure the Smash devs would be able to think of something. I mean, they made an entire moveset out of Minecraft Steve, that literally just places stuff down and swings tools around in his game. That's really impressive. 
The problem with overhauling Ganondorf in Smash is that people like his current moveset, and I mean, I get it, I like playing as him too, but I still wish it was completely different. That's why some people have come up with the idea to make Black Shadow a playable character with Ganondorf's current moveset instead. For those who don't know, Black Shadow is a character from the F-Zero games. He's an evil and muscular dude, and he has no moveset potential whatsoever, just like Captain Falcon. So making him an official Echo Fighter of Falcon, but with mostly Ganondorf's current moveset, while they also completely overhaul Ganondorf in the same game, would be an absolute perfect solution in my eyes. That way everyone's happy, and his potential moveset already mostly exists, so he wouldn't be that hard to make. This is my biggest dream for the next Smash game. I want Zelda games to be better represented in the movesets of the fighters. As for other stuff, mainly stages and music remixes, I think it's mostly fine. I like that there's a stage based on a lesser talked about Zelda game, Spirit Tracks, and I like that some music remixes are absolute bangers like Cass's theme and the classic Temple remix from Melee. One thing I don't like about the music though, is just how many Smash remixes use the main Legend of Zelda theme in it, like this one. And this one. And this one. And this one. And this one. Yes, there are even more examples, I could keep going. They're all good songs, but yeah, we get it. The main Zelda theme is very iconic. But you really don't have to use it for almost every Legend of Zelda remix, guys. So yeah, give Zelda characters better movesets. And who knows, with Tears of the Kingdom out now, Default Link has even more crazy moveset potential. I'd love to see what they do with that. And maybe they could even introduce a brand new Zelda character that isn't one of the main trio. That'd be wild. Big huge awesome shoutouts to Wright the Yoshi, Noso, Lion the Chef, Sheen for the Win, Giant Firing Cole, Sylveon 700, CPJ, Lurifax 1, The Flying Fire, Herc, Quote is cool, Super Pig X, The Game DD, Milk and Frogs, and the rest of my awesome Patreon supporters. You guys help me out more than you know. And also, a gigantic shout out to Pinky Bowtie, who drew all those amazing sketches of moveset ideas I had. I approached him on super short notice about this, so the fact that he was able to get it done and looking so great is super admirable. He recently opened up professional commissions, so go check out his page. I'll link it down below. And one last thanks to you guys for watching. My next video is going to be a positive one again, so my hater channel arc is now over. I'm also super nervous about my next video, so go subscribe if you haven't already so you can see why I'm feeling that way. It's gonna be a big one for the channel. Anyways, with that all said, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.